Hey, it's Dry Bear. And I've been getting tons of questions from people that are brand new to the CRP genre and are looking to play Baldur's Gate 3 that are asking a lot about how the game works and how to get them into the game so they can get started. One of the most common questions is, what are the character stats, why do they matter, and what should I know about them? Well, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go through all of the character stats, demystify as much of it as possible, make you very comfortable with the stats that come with your character, and make character creation a lot less stressful for you. But first, you should come hang out with me on my live stream. I'm live every single day on twitch.tv forward slash drybear. If you do come hang out with me in the community, the next time you go for a shower or a bath, the water temperature is going to be perfect right off the bat. Okay, so I've already gone through all of the classes in Baldur's Gate, all of the races, and talked about the attribution that you need for your characters. So today, I want to go a little bit further and talk about the stats and the bonuses and proficiencies and all the things that you see on this character creator screen that might be overwhelming to someone who's brand new to Baldur's Gate 3 or brand new to CRPGs in general. And the first thing to know is that this game is based heavily on D&D 5th edition. So it is, in essence, um, underneath all the layers, a tabletop game based on rolling dice and making calculations and doing math. The cool part about it, though, is it is a video game with a computer running all of that. And so all of those calculations and pen and paper and things like that you don't have to worry about. It. It'll do it all for you. It'll roll all the dice for you. It makes all the math and calculations for you. And it plays just like a video game without you having to worry about that. Which means that you get to enjoy the role play adventure and more or less you can treat it like it is just an action game where you can walk around and do things and, and devise how you're going to play and get into the story without having to have a pencil next to you as you kind of figure everything out. But when making your character and developing your party and your party composition for the playthrough that you're going to have, it is useful to know how some of that back end stuff works so that you can actually use it to your advantage. So let's start with the core stats that come with every character and what they mean. And these are, you can think of them as a role play aspect and also as a kind of game design calculation aspect. But Strength is exactly what you think strength is. It is your physical athleticism and your raw power that come from using your muscles and using your body's physical form. Most melee weapons in the game are strength based, which means that if you're looking to use a martial weapon of that kind, most of the time it's going to be strength based which means that more strength is going to make those weapons more effective. Dexterity is focused more on like finesse and ranged weapons. So any weapon that is held in the hand and utilized that doesn't fall into strength will usually just fall into dexterity, whether it's a finesse weapon or like a bow or something like that. And so if you are playing those kind of weapons as your main focus, dexterity is going to be a stat that you really want to have high value of because it will scale the effects that you have from those. But dexterity has tons of other uses too, because it will be used for various checks like lock picking for stealth. And so if you're playing a stealthy class, dexterity is going to be very useful for you. And dexterity also gives you bonuses to initiative, which just means in what order do you go in in the start of an encounter. So higher dexterity classes will usually go first in an encounter because they have a higher chance of rolling a higher value for their initiative. And for many classes and in some situations, dexterity can also be a defensive stat and you can think of it kind of like dodging because it will affect your armor class and help you pass those checks. In some cases, avoid taking damage because of it. Constitution has two primary effects on your experience and your character and how those work. The first one is going to be a minor effect on your hit points. In Baldur's Gate 3, unlike other games and other situations you might be in on other uh, like tabletop and rule sets, the hit point maximum that you have for your character, which is how much HP they have, how much damage they can take, is primarily determined by their class and by their class as they level up. Some classes gain more hit point maximum, some classes gain less, and that is prime. That's kind of the biggest contributing factor to how much hit point uh, maximum you have for your character. But Constitution can modify that some as well. The Constitution also represents endurance, and this manifests itself primarily in channeling abilities. So constitution is kind of like concentration. So if you're doing like, say you have to channel a spell and you have to keep that spell active, it will actually run checks against your constitution to see if you can maintain that concentration and keep channeling. So if you have a channeling action that's going on and you have low constitution, you're not going to be able to maintain it as long because you're going to start failing those 
those concentration checks. Intelligence is how smart your character is, and it also affects their ability to remember things and understand things. So you will constantly have checks against your intelligence when you're trying to learn something your character doesn't know at the time, or if you're trying to recall back to some important information that you might need to access, like, you know, picking at your brain, trying to remember something. And there are also intelligence skills and lots of spells that rely on intelligence as well, primarily for wizards. Any wizarding spell will have checks against intelligence for how effective they can be. And so generally wizards, which are primary stat intelligence, will rely on this for making their spells more effective. Wisdom is intuition. It's your kind of learned knowledge and, and built up of experience over time. And this one, like intelligence, will have checks against it for things that rely on that kind of attribution, but it also does affect spell casting for clerics, druids, and rangers primarily because their magics, like holy magic and nature magic, rely on wisdom rather than intelligence. And charisma is your social stat. It is your force of personality, how much character you have, how much gravitas you have, how much presence you have when you walk into a room. But it also has a significant effect on any of your dealings with any other character or person in the world. It affects your ability to lie, to deceive, to intimidate, to convince people. You might run into people that have knowledge that you want to get at, but they refuse to tell you, and charisma will help convince them to give you that knowledge. It can also affect your ability to barter and get better prices for things that you're trying to get along your story, and it does affect the spell casting for bards, sorcerers, and warlocks. So sorcerers and warlocks, for a lot of their damage they're dealing, they're trying to do charisma primary, and then bards have a wide variety of effects that they can do that scale off charisma. But because it has such a big impact on dialogue, communication, unlocking information, and bartering, it's usually good to have at least one character in your party, whether it's your character or one of your companions, that has a high charisma because it'll allow you to gain access to a lot of things. Which leads us to the next question, which is what are ability points and your allocation of them and does it really matter and why and what should I know about it? And there's a lot of behind the scenes systems and restrictions and guiding functions and all of that and it can be pretty complicated depending on what version of D&D you're talking about. And I'll make it very simple for you if you're just jumping into Baldur's Gate. You have a certain amount of points that you can allocate across all of these statistics. The most recent change for Baldur's Gate 3 is that you're not even getting bonuses for race. You can actually allocate these points freely regardless of your race. And what you want to do or accomplish with your character, you can just allocate those points to get bonuses. Now, if you wanted to, you could just use the recommended distribution. But there's some things you need to know about how this system works and might help you allocate these points. Firstly, the number 10 is kind of like your average number, which means that if you have a 10 in intelligence, you are considered to be of average intelligence in the world. You're not exceptional, but you're not on the less intelligent side. And so when you're at exactly 10, what you'll do is you'll be getting a plus zero here. And think of this plus here as a bonus. It is a bonus to any roll that this stat will roll it will add this extra modifier because you are better at it than most. So 10 is kind of your baseline. Then for every two points above 10 on even numbers, every two points, you will get a plus one. And so as you go higher and higher, you can see that up here I'm 16. I have a plus three because it's three numbers, three stacks of two above. And then you keep getting more, which means that if I'm, a, I'm rolling for a strength check on something, and I have plus three, whatever I roll, I get to add that modifier to the roll, which means I'm always going to be better at strength because I have high strength. So knowing this, if you're a complete beginner, I just recommend trying to find your two primary stats that your character cares about. It's very hard to allocate for more than just two. You don't really have that many points and you're gonna have to suffer somewhere. So pick two that really matter to you. Maybe you want to be a fighter or a paladin that's very tanky, so you want strength and constitution. Maybe you want to be a, uh, a wizard that's good at talking. So you do intelligence for damage, charisma for the conversation. Maybe you're a ranger and you want dexterity and wisdom. But pick one or two stats that you care about most and try to get them all, they're both to even numbers. The more you can get to even numbers here, the more benefits you'll get. And keep in mind that, yes, you do get bonuses for above 10, but you also get negatives for less than 10, right? So if you end up taking all of these points down and you get below 10, you will start getting negative modifiers 
for rolls against that, which is perfectly fine because remember, you're going to be making a party of four. It's not just your character going solo through the world unless you decide to do that. You have three other companions that can help fill in the gaps for the party composition that you have. So maybe your character is very good at wisdom and charisma, and so maybe you need some tanky or utilitarian companions that help fill in that gap for you so that you can be the best version of yourself that you can be and have that stat allocation. Okay, so that covers the stats as well as the ability score, the allocation of that, which just tells you what you're good at and what you're not good at. But there's another layer that gets added onto this that you have to understand to make best use of your character. And that is your proficiency. So if you're looking at a calculation of how, like, you know, the role that you get, say you swing a giant axe as a barbarian, and you want to know if you hit the target and how much damage you deal. It's going to roll a dice to figure out how much that is on the back end. You don't have to worry about this. Um, and then it'll, it's going to add the modifier bonus that we just talked about. So if you're swinging a strength weapon as a strength class and you roll the dice to see how, if you hit and how much damage you do, it's going to add that strength modifier that you have for being an extra strong class using what you're good at. But there's a third bonus that you can get, which comes from your proficiency. Proficiency just means that you're good at it. You are a proficient user of whatever that is. And so if you are proficient in martial weapons and you're a barbarian stringing, swinging a strength weapon, you get to add the roll that you got plus the modifier that you got for your main stat plus the proficiency because you're using something you're proficient with, which makes sense. So you kind of want to have a good distribution of the stats that you have and also utilize things that you're proficient in. And by the way, proficiency goes both ways. You do get bonuses for using things that you're proficient in, and you do get negatives for things for using things you're not proficient in. One of the biggest things here is with armor. If you're wearing armor that you're not proficient in, like say you are a sorcerer and you want to use armor, but for the sorcerer class, you don't have any armor proficiencies. You just have cloth. You do wear robes you're a caster. And so there's no proficiency there for the armor unless you get it from your race, but you can equip those pieces of armor. But since you're using armor you're not proficient in, the biggest downside for that is that it blocks all spell casting. If you're wearing armor you're not proficient in, you get a major negative in that you can't cast any spells. And so that is an example, a very common example of what happens when you venture into areas where you don't have that kind of proficiency. When you're selecting your race, you'll have things like movement speed. Movement speed is just how far your character can go in a singular turn. And so you can get ways to modify this. Things like, uh, you know, like wood elves will uh, be able to get uh, extra bonus movement speed, allow them to go further than most characters in combat. So you may want to consider that when you're picking your character. Your race and class will also come with proficiencies against specific checks like stealth, which means that if you try to hide and someone looks your way, you'll roll a dice to see if you get revealed or not. And you might have a proficiency in stealth, which gives you more value in that. Proficiency in perception allows you to look at a trap to see what it's about, or maybe look at a wall to see if there's a fake door there or something to reveal that to give you more uh, opportunities along that line. And in your character creator, you might also see things like advantage or disadvantage. And this is super simple. It's just a noun that they gave to, the, <laughs> to the, the, the mechanic itself, but it's very straightforward. All advantage or disadvantage means is that if you are normal, there's no advantage or disadvantage, you're just equal, you're gonna roll the dice and take whatever happens. If you have advantage, it means that you're gonna roll two dice and take the higher of the two values. So it's kind of like bad luck protection. If you have advantage, like when you sneak up on someone or you get some kind of bonus, it means that you get to roll two dice and take the higher of the two, so you always have a little bit better chance of getting a good number because you're rolling an extra time. Same thing goes for disadvantage. If someone sneaks up on you and attacks you from behind and you're at disadvantage, it means that you're going to roll two dice and take the lower of the two numbers. So you're more likely to be unluckily, unlucky when you're at a disadvantage. The other thing you'll see in your character creator is a saving throw. This is just a reaction chance to roll a dice and get a better outcome when you're being affected or hit by something, right? So if ice comes underneath you and your character is about to slip and fall, you might get the opportunity to throw a dice and see if maybe you brace yourself and catch yourself from falling on the way down. Or when you're on the ground and you're bleeding out, you might have a saving throw that keeps you uh, going and you get a, a second wind and you can stand back up. 
things like that. And so there are saving throws for all the major stats, more or less, and then you get proficiencies in this, which means you get a bonus to these saving throws. So for example, a saving throw for like charisma or constitution or strength, based on whatever you have bonus there, might make that easier for you. So think about what those might be. And the last major thing to think about when you're looking at your character creation is to look at your spells and cantrips. Most characters, races, and classes have an option of a cantrip, and casters have an option at spells. And there's a very big, uh, easy way to understand this. Again, they just made a word to call it something, but it is pretty straightforward. Spells are spells that you cast and they have levels associated with them, right? Level one, level two, level three. This scales up what they do, but costs more and you have to have more knowledge and understanding to cast the higher level spells as you would expect. Spells also cost spell slots, which have a limited time use. If you played games uh, like from FromSoft, like Dark Souls or Demon Souls or Elden Ring, you know that you can't pick up a spell and cast it infinitely every time you rest at a bonfire, you have to, you have a certain number of uses of that spell before you have to rest again. And that just gives you a limited use of that spell that you have to think about how you use. But it would suck pretty hard if spellcasters had just that mechanic and nothing else because when they run out of spell casts, they're effectively useless. So it would be nice if they had a type of spell that doesn't ever run out. It's effectively a level zero spell. It's not quite as powerful as level one, two, or higher, but it doesn't ever run out. It's infinite use. And that is exactly what a cantrip is. A level zero spell that has no uh, amount of consumption. You can use it infinitely over and over and over. And this just makes spellcasters and uh, other options just feel better because you have these choices that you can implement that don't run out, you can use them as much as you want. They're not as strong, but it keeps you being uh, part of the combat uh, engagements every single turn because you have this infinite resource. So a lot of classes and races will have access to a lot of different cantrips. And that's what you're choosing is, what level zero spell or ability or active do I want to have in my pocket that I could pull out at any time and use as much as I want to kind of help them? specify my role play or affect the battle in ways that make sense for my character. Some characters, races, and classes gain more of these as they level up, as they specialize or multi-class, and same thing goes for the spells as well, so you'll be able to get those. But you do, for most classes, races, and characters, and spellcasters, have to choose from a list that you'll have at the very beginning and as you go through your story. So I recommend reading through these spells and figuring out what makes sense for you and what works. There's not really any spells in the game that are useless. That are all like the game is very free in choice, and there's a lot of different ways to approach every situation. So just think about what makes sense for you and what you like, and uh, kind of fit that in for your spell slots and your cantrips. You will also be able to select skills and proficiencies on top of your race based on your class. And in some cases, you may be able to specialize in certain things. You'll find this in the skills tab at the top. Um, this will look a little bit different on release but this, the this basic mechanics are the same. And so you might be able to add in proficiencies or remove proficiencies that you might want. And this is exactly what we've gone over already with the proficiencies. Arcana might allow you to divine things from you know, alien magics or different uh, you know, machines that you don't understand. Maybe you can recognize it and, and break it down and figure out what it does or kind of remove enchanted things stuff like that. Deception allows you to lie or manipulate or do things like that. You can threaten and make people fearful. You can persuade. All of these are here. And some classes like the fighter um, or the ranger can specialize in very specific things. So when you're making uh, those classes, you might get extra bonuses um, as an option for that. So like fighters can choose their fighting style. They'll get bonuses to ranged weapons or shields and armor or using two-handed. When you're playing a ranger, you can choose your primary target, the thing you're good at hunting as a ranger. Uh, one of the most common ones is you can actually pick up Ranger Knight, which does give you a proficiency in armor, which allows you to be a little bit tankier with that and wear heavier armor even as a ranger. So you have those options there. So look through your extra proficiencies that come along. There's a bunch of them in the game, and there's tons that, uh, that come with specific classes or races or different opportunities but you know now how that system works. So I hope that covers and demystifies a lot of the systems that exist in the game and make it very clear. I think that 
I've heard a lot of people saying it's too overwhelming. I can't make a character. The stats are wild. I don't know what's going on. But realistically, a lot of these are just nouns that were given to mechanics to help uh, people talk about them in conversation. And they're very easy to understand once you know how everything works. So that's it. If you found value in the video, leave a like down below. Leave a comment for the algorithm so that it helps this video get seen by more people. And I'll see you on my live stream. If you enjoyed yourself today, leave a like down below. You can support me and my work on Patreon and view Patreon exclusive content. Link in the description. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one.